just wanted to start off by saying thank you for the film. It really brought me back to moments of my childhood, like away from technology, where it was kind of just all about where your imagination could take you. So I just want to say th thank you for that. Um, also, thank someone you. who loves movies, it's just awesome to see a movie from someone who clearly loves movies. I could tell that that came right <laughs> through the screen. Um, yeah. So being that this is clearly about someone who loves movies, how did you aim to make that subject matter connect with pretty much anyone? Well, you know, I just tried to be as honest as possible to dig into my own childhood and uh, literally going back to my roots and uh, just talking with my friends and family and just recollecting all the memory of falling in love with movies. And somehow I didn't know that it is so universal, of course. <laughs> you know, I'm really surprised. Just a few days ago, we were talking to you know, uh, uh, audience in Peru, in Lima. And, you know, it's uh, incredible how, you know, the, the people have been able to relate to this film and the story. Uh, you know, a um, few weeks ago, we had a uh, great opening in Japan. It's still playing. And, you know, again, the interaction, whether whichever part of the world we are, whether Spain, Europe or India, it's it's been overwhelming, you know, completely. And more so as you know, with the arrival of streaming platform and pandemic, you know, a lot of people who love cinema missed going to cinema. So so there was more the reason, uh, you know, sort of people start connecting with the story. So what? It happens in a small village in India, but there seems to be something really universal ab about all of us who fall in love with cinema, you know, regardless of what kind of movie you watch. But there is that element of magic, you know, just going into a hall and wait for light to dim and then magic appears on the screen and you know we are just transported for those two hours into someone else's life and you know and that still is magical and and I guess somehow uh, this film also celebrates that kind of a uh, you know spirit that we all can dream and <laughs> you know and uh, be a little bit like the tagline of of the movie, you know, when you have nothing, nothing can stop you. So you mentioned streaming services. So I, I just wanted to ask, how do you think like the internet affects film? Do you think it's possible to make like the magic of cinema as you described it come to life on a phone or through social media? I, uh, uh, I mean, as a, as a filmmaker, I feel that, um, you know, we are all storyteller and we have to embrace the changes, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, we, you know, I mean, there was, as we know, there was theater, then there was movies and silent movies and talkies and, you know, and then VFX and uh, virtual reality. And so I do believe that, yes, there is too much of exposure, you know, and too much happening along with the phone, but it's like going back way back in the history of our uh, human culture that when the, you know, sort of writing pen was invented or pencil, you know, everyone didn't become writer, you know. <laughs> so I do feel that everyone with smartphone might not become a filmmaker because there will still be a room for storyteller, you know, who bring unique stories to the world. And at the same time, it's a freedom that, you know, we all have a pen, we can scribble, write our notes. But at the same time, we look forward to reading novels or stories or classical history. So I think it would be something like that. However, I do feel um, uh, worried about going into the theater, theatrical experience, you know, because it's getting more and more difficult for independent film or anything which is made outside studio system to have a cinematic or theatrical release. So um, I do feel that as a creator, if I make something for, I'm developing films and shows, but I think very differently when I'm writing for streaming platform, when I know people will be consuming this story on uh, smartphone or on <laughs> laptop, you know, the approach for me is slightly different in cinematic treatment is very different because especially the sound design is totally different, you know, than uh, when, when, when someone is going to watch on the phone. And you know that you will not have his or her full attention. You know, there would be uh, obstacles as they watch the show. So how do you keep the story interesting? You know, meanwhile, when you have captive, captive audience in cinema, we always were able to take a lot more risk, you know, in terms of 
experimentation cinematically. So now with the streaming platform, I guess one has to do something different. But uh, it is, I think, maybe the IMAX format, you know, or something larger than life, you know, those kind of cinemas will survive. I've been traveling with last film show around the world as it's been theatrically released since last October. I went to like about 14, 15 countries now. And everywhere it's the same concern, you know, most of the cinema halls are shutting down or the one which shut down during the pandemic never reopened. So uh, according to some statistics, we might have lost around 30, 35% of theaters forever. Uh, so that's a big number, you know, and not only that, what's scary is quite a few distributors who have distributed my movie since last 10, 15 years, they are all shutting shop, you know. They said once our backlog is over, we are not going to buy new movies because we find it very, very hard to find cinema hall to release them. So even though we have a good intention, we want to get the movie, but if we buy, then we just, you know, rather sell, we don't, we'll probably sell it to television or streaming network, which producers are doing directly, you know. So, uh, so, so I been talking to, you know, I, I was talking to distributors in Spain, in Germany, more recently in Japan, and there is the common echo that, you know, big action, epic movie with huge marketing budget and social media bombardment, hyped up movies, you know, and everyone else would have a very difficult competition to survive, uh, you know, to, to, to possibly find a theatrical release. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked your answer about how, you know, everyone had a pencil, but not necessarily everyone's like a storyteller or a writer. You know, I really liked that. Um, what I also really liked was the film's cinematography. I was curious what the approach was to make the lighting of these grounded, more grounded locations stand out. So I think what we uh, what we tried to do was we, uh, and as it's also, uh, there was two things we were trying to do uh, in the movie, celebrate life light and time you know so uh you know th these are the key element which makes cinema breathe <laughs> you know light and time so uh first thing we did with light was that uh the the, the modern digital light capture uh, devices are extremely sharp you know and sometimes they have a very synthetic look so it works for if you are creating a you know i don't know science fiction universe or action but for certain subject, it's like choosing a color palette. You know, it's like a wrong color that you know that this kind of landscape you should be painting in watercolor, but instead you are forced to use oil paint. You know, so in a way, what we started doing was that first, how do we capture this light? You know, and so uh, we we used uh, old vintage lenses from 80s and 90s. They were Russian lenses called Lomo and some lenses called Hawk, which were mainly designed. Uh, for uh, celluloid, you know, for movie cameras. And uh, we use the Arri Alexa digital camera to try to marry the two, you know, by designing uh, some adapter. And the result started looking really close to what we were after because it was turning the image imperfect just the way we wanted. You know, it was removing all the perfection, sharp edges, it was going out focus where we wanted, in a way giving very organic tone to color and food and films and walls and skin tone. And and uh, in, and it was able to capture kind of a light, which is not actually a celluloid light, but same time, it's not even digital, you know, something in between. Um, so so that's that that's what we sort of try to do at, at first go. Uh, and then we sort of came up with a palette of color that, you know, how do we sort of advance that, you know, the Samai's world where he lives in his village and school has certain color scheme. But every time he goes to watch movie, like the popular Indian cinema, Bollywood or Tollywood, you know, it's filled with color and everything is over the top. And so suddenly there will be riots of color when he goes into the cinema hall. But when he comes out, we come back to, you know, a realistic color, which is just the natural green and uh, railway station and train and the house and the food color. Uh, and later as the film reaches the climax, you know, we have again celebration of all those color palette when we come to sequence of bangle, you know, in the film, you know, and uh, so, so that's the kind of a light and color scheme we try to weave uh, from beginning to end, you know, being uh, careful about what color we show. 
So every time we were telling stories, uh, we celebrated color, light, and time. So which could be like with the colorful glasses at the first time, then second time matchbox story, he collects matchbox images. Then we have, you know, single frame, then the projected images. So all those colors, you know, we try to sort of uh, slightly distant it from the immediate reality of Samai, you know, where he lives, you know, we, because in, 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 especially in India, you know, that was my own experience. Cinema was like escape from reality. You know, it was, we, as a kid, I never saw any realistic cinema. You know, when I went there, it was totally another world. It had nothing to do with my reality. You know, everything is over the top because they were mainly popular Indian cinema. You know, they will bust in song and dance and uh, the hero will be kicking 50 people flying in the sky, you know. So, and I had never seen that. And when you go out, you have another life, you know. So that's exactly, we sort of said, how do we capture that also through the idea of some, uh, the time and light and uh, uh, even the framing, uh, you know, the, the cinematic composition. Because certain time we wanted to pay conscious homage to certain filmmaker, but not at a cost of stopping the film or, uh, you know, may, of course, cinephile would know, but, you know, normal people might not know, oh, that particular frame when somebody goes near the projection booth, the light reflected on his face is like 2001 Space Odyssey. You know, it's like a we sort of purposely sort of did <laughs> the lighting so it recalls, uh, you know, Kubrick, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the shot in the space. So similarly, you know, we try to weave and a couple of places where it looked too gimmicky or too out of the place, we removed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I love that. Um, and you mentioned food, and I really like how you show food in the movie. Um, why do you think food works as something that kind of like ties the narrative together? Once again, it was kind of inspired from my own childhood because as a kid, you know, there were like few, th there were only few things were important in my life, which I, which I had put big five letter F all over the production base while we were making the film. So it was F for film, of course, F for food, F for friends, F for family and F for future, you know. So these five Fs were sort of driving my childhood, uh, you know, and in the same way, I realized, okay, when I, I would like my cast and crew to stay focused on food, film, friendship, family, and, you know, everything leading to the future. So, and the food um, uh, was, it became kind of a big metaphor as well, because Samay finds his friendship with Fuzzle, the projectionist, you know, by winning his heart, but way to win his heart is through, heart is through his stomach, you know. So when he starts swapping his lunchbox, you know, and uh, and that's something what I did as a kid, uh, and my mother used to be a great cook, you know, and she, and I remember like hours, you know, I mean, anyone who is familiar with Indian cooking would know that how long, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the people who cook end up spending time in the kitchen. So there were always memory of lush green vegetables and red chilies and cumin. And, you know, there were like riots of color again coming into kitchen, uh, you know, and uh, so I, I, for me, it was really important. Second, you know, uh, when I was a kid, the Indian movies were known as masala movies. You know, masala means spices, you know, spice stuff films. So then, there again, it was, <laughs> you know, a, a great way to say, like, you know, everyone in India say, oh, you're going to watch masala movies, you know, so which is everything which doesn't play at A-list festival is called masala movies, you know. <laughs> So food, of course, became a you know very important part of uh, Samai and Fuzzle's friendship, and it became a bond that they will bond with food and films. All right, thanks for that. Um, so I'm in film school, so I kind of feel the need to ask uh, what your advice would be for like young adults like me and people in film school pursuing film as a career. <clears throat> you know, I was uh, a couple of places I did. A master class, you know, in, uh, uh, not or like a retreat. And I was shocked because the dean in Singapore gave me some statistics that every six months, there are about 800,000 students across the world graduate with screenwriting and direction degree. You know? 
So that's like, that's like, wow. <laughs> I mean, that includes university, private school, you know. And uh, so now, you know, it's, it is a very chaotic place, you know. And, and it's uh, for young people, I would just say in this jungle, I would, I have always encouraged honesty of storytelling, you know, not to get confused in people who tell you, oh, there is this formula, how to write, how to direct, you know, like I've never really read those books, never believed in, oh, oh, in five steps, you become a screenwriter. No, you don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's an illusion. You might learn a few things about craft of writing, but you will never become the storyteller, you know, and there are, I have not seen till today a proof of somebody studied 20 books and became a great screenwriter. You know, I've been to many retreats in Sundance in Europe and been talking to some great screenwriter from people who have written Blade Runner to you name it, you know, like different movies. And no one has said, oh, these five books changed my life, you know. So, so I think the to let uh, life nourish you, you know, as much as possible. You know, film school, yes, will te teach you great technique, but as far as stories are concerned, let that come from life, not from the school. You know, do not, I, I don't believe, you know, that one should have be conditioned with three act structures, uh, all this, there's just so many theories which are extremely confusing. You know, and like when I was in Singapore film school, you know, with the films, screenwriting student, you know, we did a simple exercise. You know, there were about eight, 18 to 20 students. And I said, okay, each one of you must tell a joke. And I was shocked that only five of them were able to narrate the joke really well with a great punchline, you know. So, so for me, that was already a bad start, you know, that to be a screenwriter, that you can't get a structure of a joke right. You know, that how does a small joke you know, going to end up with a punchline, you know, and, and you should be focusing on that. You know, I think uh, people should be focusing on storytelling you know, and, and then to learn in school, the craft can be useful. So some of the film school might hate me for saying that, but, <laughs> but if I had personally, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, I would rather go and make a film, you know, <laughs> than go to a film school. Then, you know, because I'm, self-taught filmmaker and I wanted to go to film school honestly speaking uh, and uh, I applied to the film and television institute of India which is a very prestigious institute and because my English was very weak right at the first there are three three steps for application and at the very first stage I was rejected because I did not have enough grades in English and mathematics and physics to go to film school so then I never tried, you know, and I said, okay, doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, you know, I will, I will, I just started shooting wedding videos to buy small film roll and on a 16 mm camera, I shot a lot of silent films, you know, and because to make a sound film was really expensive. So today, especially all of you, you know, uh, who are in film school, you are spoiled because you have you have iPhone 14, you know, and a laptop. You can just make a feature film, you know, easily. I mean, uh, and and we couldn't do that when I was your age. I couldn't do that because you know I had to shoot a film, then process it, then get sound and try to marry the negative. It'll cost used to cost a bomb. So I, I ended up with a lot of silent short clips of two minutes, four minutes, whatever I can afford, you know, which has to project, get few friends together. And it took me a long time to complete a short film, you know, in 35 mil, you know, and to find money and able to send it out. Uh, so, so in a way, I think today there are all the tools are there and uh, the confusion lies in the storytelling, the kind of stories you want to tell. And some of the student I have seen, I won't generalize, but they rush into getting into action or horror or genre movie, you know, without even allowing to discover themselves, who they are, you know, where do they come from? What are their roots? You know, what touches them? What are their weaknesses? What are their worldview? You know, without defining that, they sort of jump into, uh, you know, sort of formulaic structure because it might be good for your career. And sometimes it works, but then I do believe that steam runs out <laughs> pretty well. So honesty and storytelling can go pretty far. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, thanks for talking. Thank you. Thanks for your answers. Okay. Appreciate that.
Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.